Thank you very much. Okay. Hi everyone, I'm from New York, and there's a few of us that are here. We met together and some of us came up with sort of like one question to you, Father Fernando. Um, you mentioned about how it's important to move around and you made a focus and an interest on young people. I absolutely, totally agree with you. Um, as, as a CCD teacher, now for formation, um, I realized very early on how important it is for the church to continue to survive, for us to give total attention to the youth. Unfortunately, in New York, our children receive um, formal instruction about our faith up until the time that they are confirmed, and then, as St. John would say, nada, after that. <laughs> so what has happened is that the person ages, but their, their, their instruction on the faith has stayed at the ninth grade level. So then, my question to you, Padre, is that how can we, as late Carmelites that are, are, are out there in the trenches, are teaching the, the next generation about the faith, what more can we do? And as a lay Carmelite, because I think that that's an important piece, the fact that not only would I be a faith formation instructor, but I'm also a lay Carmelite. How can we set fire to our youth? Our youth are being taken up by gangs, especially in New York. I can only speak, I live in New York. Uh, there's this awful gang called MS-13 that's actually killing our youth. And if they don't join, they will be murdered, they will be dismembered, they will be gone. So what can we do? We are a prayerful community, yes, we do pray, but we need to roll up our sleeves and, and, and do some work in the vineyard to save our youth and to save our church, most especially. <laughs> Is that to me? It's the boss. So okay. I will make a little summary. I think the question was in this world that is uh, complicated, especially for young people, and their violence. She was mentioned in a case in uh, New York. Uh, how can we as Carmelite, uh, especially late Carmelites, fire the, the young people in faith and, and all that. It's, it's more or less the question. I think most of the people heard what you said, but okay. So first of all, I want to say that the background of that uh, sentence of the Pope, of that, that reflection of the Pope, was the next uh, synod on youth and vocations. So the main topic of the discussion was if it, if it is good or not to put vocation together with youth, or it should be just a youth, and within that, vocation will appear naturally, or to put vocation may manipulate a little bit the main aim of the synod or not. So there were some discussions about that. So what I wanted to say is that um, in that context, the Pope was underlining the importance of be, being with the, with the youth, being with the young people in our religious life. He was talking to religious male uh, superiors and he was underlying that. And um, of course it's a very big challenge, not easy. The Pope himself was giving some uh, clues, some ideas. The first one was uh, to involve youth in action. You remember the sentence? So for you, young people, action comes before reflection. So action without reflection is world is uh, dangerous, but the reflection without action is uh, ideas, ideas, ideas. That was the, the sentence of the Pope. So to do that, you have to be with uh, the young people. I know that not everybody has that gift from the Holy Spirit. So some people are very good working with young people, and they are able to stay with them, and, and some people are not so gifted for, for young people, so it's, it's not easy. 
two answers. The first one is that uh, the, the, the proof that it is a difficult question is that the church is going to organize a synod about this. Because there is a big preoccupation, especially in Western world, that the contact of the church with youth um, longs till confirmation. Okay? So it is okay for sacraments, but after sacraments, we don't know what to offer. We don't know how to keep the youth enjoying faith or whatever. So sacraments are a good excuse, inverted commas, but when we have no more sacraments to offer, it seems we have nothing to offer. So how do you create a young adults, communities, and, and things like that? So that's what we are going to reflect in the, in the synod. It's not only a problem of the Carmelites, it's a problem of many religious orders and congregations and dioceses and local churches and so on. Uh, we are trying to do something in Europe uh, because the, the councillor for Europe, Father John Keating from Ireland, is very worried about uh, the contact of the order with, with you, you know, and perhaps because Europe is becoming the weakest part of the order in this sense. If you go to Africa, there are hundreds of thousands of young people around our houses. If you go to Asia, even here in America, I mean, but in Europe, is, uh, the church is getting aged. And what we have created is, uh, what he has created is this group uh, Awakening, and the title is already significant, uh, Awakening, and they are trying to program with young people, not for, but with young people, they are trying to create a program for the next few years, they have had uh, different assemblies already, what can we offer to them, what can we, so we are trying to discern about that. What I would uh, say is to be very open to the next synod. We'll see what the, the synod say, the, says in the local churches and all that. And my worry about Carmel, my, the, the challenge from the Carmelite point of view, what about uh, this elitist uh, prayer or elitist idea of mysticism that doesn't want to have any contact with disturbing groups, you know, uh, young or simple people, we are in another level of prayer and mysticism and so on. So I think that, that it's, it's not that I, uh, it, it, happened, it, it doesn't happen always, or I'm not, I don't want to be critical or, you know, or demagogical or whatever, but it may be in some groups I perceive a sort of elitism, you know, and, and we have to meet young people because it's part of the people of God that we have in our hands. Thank you. I think it's better if you <laughs> I have a couple of questions. One for Father Fernando and the other one for Father Bingo. My first question to you, Father Fernando, has something to do with your big talk about the challenge on renewed renewal. Because we have in the past we are sometimes confronted with loss of enthusiasm. I have experienced that um, firsthand with our community because we used to have about a third five or so members and since that time we have dwindled in our number and has um, become really small to the extent that I fear that my, there might come a time when our community won't exist anymore. And so I reach out to some members who were not attending and I mentioned to them that you have to come back and, and uh, meet with us because that's part of our um, being a Carmelite is to attend functions of the Carmelite Carmelite. And the answer was, well, once you're a Carmelite, you're a Carmelite forever. But I said that we have some obligations to and maybe a meet, uh, coming to the meeting is one of them. Or maybe at least um, let them us know the reason why. So that is my, and I know that we need to have a continued renewal process, but how can someone have that continued process of renewal if she would even attend our meeting and have the opportunity to do that with uh, the co-members of the family? So that was my question to you, 
My other question is the kind of bingo. And this is something about reading the Bible. But I am not really uh, into the reading of the Bible every day. So I don't know if I'm practicing and I will practice in karma life, but I attend Mass every day. So I listen to the Gospels and the reading, and I do attend Mass at either which to end only to listen to the homily. Because I thought that if I read it by myself with an um, explanation from a priest, I won't understand what the um, scripture is saying. Just like um, an example to you is the, the parable of the wages, for instance, where um, some people were invited to come and work in the vineyard and was given the same amount of salary or wages at the end of the day when some have come the first hour in the morning, middle part of the day, and the late part of the afternoon, but they receive the same wages. To me, I would consider that that's not being fair. <laughs> but then I, I listen to the explanation of the priest, and actually it doesn't really apply to that because it has something to do with the, the Lord's saying that my thoughts are not your thoughts and my ways are not your ways. So how can we reconcile those two things? Me not being able to read the Bible on my own, but attending the Mass regularly. Thank you. This is a very difficult question. If I had a solution, I would be in the Vatican in a uh, office or something like that. I could say four words. First one being faithful. I appreciate very much, uh, you know, loyalty, perseverance, and you know, to be there. You know, it's, uh, when I was young, those words. When I was younger, those words seemed to me to be old novice director words. You know, and, and perseverance and all that. You know. But this is a very important value, you know, to be there, to stay, to, to, to remain, to be faithful, to be loyal, you know. So even if it is a little group, if it is stay there, you know. Secondly, um, creativity. So if we keep doing always the same, perhaps something is missing, you know. So the group has to be also open to little changes or to changes, you know. Some groups say, oh, or some monasteries or Oh, we don't have vocation, we have many, but they left, all of them, and, but they are close to any little change. So also creativity in a balanced way, not just changing things just for changing, you know. To be creative is also important, you know, to be faithful, to be creative. Third, to be generous. I think this is also very important, you know, if we are generous with our vocation, each vocation uh, will try to keep on working and building and, and and I think that, that's also very important. And the fourth one could be to be joyful. I think this is a very important part of our way of life. You know, if you are joyful, if you, are, if you have a life of plenitude, of course, with problems and lacks and all that, but at the same time, if you have a joyful life, you know, I think those four words may, may help. And you were speaking about a community that is becoming aged and perhaps uh, I used to say that also. I, to tell you the truth, I'm very honest. Uh, I am a little bit fed up of these statistics, how many will be in 2029, apocalyptic uh, plans, and all. Okay, so we have so many problems already, that give me you know, a little bit of fresh air or whatever. And, and we should be also very careful to think that aging or old is a synonymous of uh, bad or, you know, so, I remember once in an academical visitation we had a very aged brother and the students were talking about uh, something and they said, Father, how did you do that in your times? How did you do that? And he said, what are my times? These are my times. Nobody is excluded of that, you know. So, oh, we have to be also conscious about the richness of a small group. Please be faithful, be creative, be generous, and be joyful. Amen.
Well, I, I would uh, um, begin with, uh, with the parable you mentioned in answering this uh, question. Uh, there are many different explanations of the parable. And uh, it is true, it's not just if we look at the parable from the position, from the mentality of, the, of what we find in the world. So if you work more, you deserve more, and it's clear. On the other hand, the parable says that all those people who were invited to the vineyard, they respond when they were told. At the same time, they didn't delay. So it was not their responsibility for not being called in hope. And this is from the position of God. When he looks at us, the only thing that comes is what do you say after God wants you for something? Yes or no? It's not your guilt if you don't read the Bible because it's not the way you communicate with God. You prefer to listen and you prefer to join your listen to the to the holy mass and receiving communion <coughs> helps you. So this is your answer. And you should not be worried if you don't read the Bible, because you listen to the Bible and you listen to homilies or whatever. Everyone answers in his own way. And everyone is called to answer to live his own life. We are different. And God knows us. He knows what he created. And what he expect, expects is to answer personally to his God. That's all. So um, I would say you should not be uh, uh, concerned about that because even if you don't see the Bible, you will receive the same salary as the one who is every day. develop a little bit how our normal practice of the faith, which is so centered on the human, is contrary to, to your whole vision, this integrated vision uh, of, of the environment and, and the whole creativity of, of opening ourselves to union with the earth. Well, thank you. Um, that's a wonderful question. Um, I, I really hope that that becomes a key question for your own thinking after this conference, because um, this is the most important, these problems are the most important problems we are facing. Not the diminishment of religious orders, <coughs> frankly. Not even the diminishment of the church, but the diminishment of the planet. And that is what our young people are facing. And if we don't get that, we are really going to be missing something huge. So this is what Thomas Berry said many, many years ago. This is why I draw on Teilhard de Chardin. Teilhard is talking about the cosmic Christ of the universe. So a sense of the historical Jesus is fine. But the St. John's Gospel begins with, in the beginning is a logos. In the beginning is an incarnational principle through all of reality. That's why this is a divine milieu. And the fact that we are destroying it, it's tearing out pages of the Bible. Whether we read the Bible or not, we are destroying creation. That's the point. Medieval theology tells us the primary revelation <coughs> is through the scriptures of the earth. Secondary revelation is in the written scriptures. Another revelation is in history, and the fourth re revelation is in the human heart. But we are missing the revelation of nature. And that is the hugest challenge of our times. Because there is no future without a response to this question. So it's true, the traditions have been concentrating on personal salvation getting to heaven, or human-earth relations. 
or the poor, social justice, and so on. Our spirituality is inadequate to the task that we need. That is, that is the challenge. So, to me, I'm a 60s person, very involved in justice, very involved in trying to think this through for a long-term period, very involved in trying to say, what is hope? What is the zest for life that the young, younger generation is thinking about, looking for? But to me, if our tradition doesn't embrace a logos, an incarnational spirituality, a sacramental understanding, we can't have baptism with water that is polluted. We can't have a Eucharist with wine grown with pesticides and herbicides. We can't have wheat and bread, you see, in that kind of a framework. So we need to change our sense of a sacramental understanding of a cosmological Christ. It's in St. Paul. It's in right there in his epistle. So this is the biggest challenge. Almost everything is secondary. I can't say it strongly enough. Our planet is going down. If you could hear what I hear day in and day out at our School of the Environment, it would scare <laughs> tremendous, tremendous concern about the future of the planet. That is what we have to respond to. I'd just like to make that just throw a suggestion uh, to, to the group and uh, that you can uh, pick up, uh, Dr. Tucker. Um, since our young people are really involved in, in working, worrying about the environment, and you know they're busy telling their parents, but they're recycling and so on away. Um, maybe this would be a good way for people who want to engage youth in our communities to uh, engage with you and um, you know basically bring them in and give them not only the knowledge of the scientists and every scientist I know is terrifying because they know things that we don't even want to know um, but yeah so anyway that's that's just all I'm suggesting and maybe you could suggest uh, that people develop courses in some way that would be appealing to young people, combining a little bit of the ideas of sacramentality with um, the uh, environment. So that's what we've been doing for two decades, trying to bring the religions into this question. There is an explosive literature in Christianity on environmental ethics, on sacramental theology, uh, on all of these kinds of issues. You see, if you look at the Forum on Religion and Ecology at Yale, you will see statements from all the religious traditions. There's a lot on Christianity. Here you will see engaged projects along the lines of what you're talking about. And I'm at a high school teacher's workshop right now, teaching world religions so that they can teach those traditions in this, this vein. So. There's a lot of resources out there, how you teach it and so on, and I think you are absolutely right. The young people are in a desert, and this is what they're looking for. Millie, Millie is a um, spiritual guide, and I know she had her hand up back there, too. I wonder if you have actually developed in, your, in spirituality centers or in parishes um, some of the insights from the academic world. I mean, you're doing some things now with high schools, are you? some real hands-on stuff that we could hear about? Well, um, yes, I mean, I think high school education is absolutely critical to this, and it's also why we have Journey of the Universe are, is available in online classes. Um, it's been translated into many, many languages, as I mentioned, and so on. There's a curriculum for how you teach it um, that is online for the Journey of the Universe Org. We'll talk about this tomorrow, not to, tonight actually. But a spirituality, you see, of, of this sense of a sacred universe is, is what we're trying to bring forward with Journey of the Universe, but also with the religions, and each one of the religions. Yeah. Um, Dr. Tucker, I have family members who are in really involved in conservation of animals. I think that with the 
Aboriginal Indigenous peoples, the connection with nature is very strong. One of the reasons is because their life depends upon them and always have. So they have a natural respect uh, and conservation because they knew if they took too much, then there'd be none for tomorrow. And they respected the animals and uh, thanked them for their sacrifice. And so I guess my question is, modern man has so isolated and shut out the natural world and protected themselves and we control this and we control that and we control something else. How do we reconnect our young people through experience with nature? They need to have a natural experience, I think be out there in nature and connect with it and realize their dependence. Absolutely. And again, that's what we're doing up at the uh, Seneca Retreat House with the high school teachers. And this is their question, too. You know, the one uh, teacher who teaches in New York is like, I take them outside, I take them to Central Park. Another is taking them to the Natural History Museum to see this all of the universe and all of the earth and stuff. But one of them is saying, I'm just trying to get them to breathe because their anxiety level is so huge. You've all had training in spiritual practice and meditation and contemplation. They haven't got any idea of what it is to breathe, to contemplate, to move to a level of deep caring from that contemplative uh, practice, but they are yearning to do so. Nature is a healing bomb, it's a tonic, for the toxicities that we live with, and I don't mean only water, I mean toxicities of media, toxicities of a world that's lost this profound sensibility. It's why we made Journey of the Universe, to reactivate that sense of connection to nature. So you can do it through media, you can do it through environmental education, you can do it through contemplation of nature, too. You see, the Psalms have tremendous feeling for nature. I have a question about uh, John Paul II and uh, the South Carmelite spirituality and also Oh, how are we bringing the Carmelite way in all the institutes and all the um, organizations that have taken uh, root after the John Paul II is um, filling uh, the world with the gospel? Because this, this called Carmelite spirituality was very much a part of John Paul II's, I'm sorry, uh, journey. And um, how does uh, his entry into the discussed Carmelite Third Order um, uh, work with his papacy. Does the papal charism overwhelm the discussed Carmelite char uh, charism and becomes um, kind of um, drowned into the sea of the papacy, or is it very much a pope with a discussed Carmelite charism that we should really uh, be a presence uh, as discussed Carmelites in every uh, discussed Carm in every John Paul II institute and um, uh, organization? I don't know how many are there, but. When I was at the John Paul II Institute in Washington, D.C., I very much wished that there would have been a discussed Carmelite faculty that had been living the charism and understood the spirituality. Um, so just a question, and also his mission extended to the United Nations, and I wonder if you had been inspired by any of his uh, uh, teachings or um, Conferences. Well, you were speaking about John Paul II, and that he was a member of our family. You know, and, yeah, he was he was a third order member, a second order member. And, 
he was very, his doctoral dissertation was on St. John of the Cross and the Dark Knight of Faith. Uh, speaking about the nature and the environmental issue, the St. John of the Cross, uh, he speaks about creation that leads towards God, just uh, meditating and contemplating what God has created. And uh, in his spiritual family, for example, uh, he finds God in everything. And this is a mystical experience of God's presence in this world. So as Carmelites, we can join this issue with, uh, with what happens today in the world. And uh, I would say that, uh, as um, Dr. Tucker said in her conference, that consciousness and conscience should join together also in terms of spirituality. This is what we find like in, uh, in the parable we spoke about this morning uh, of the Good Samaritan. The lawyer who knew everything, his consciousness was clear. He knew what was written in the law, but his conscience did not move him to do what was he supposed to do. He didn't know how to join these two things. And this is spirituality. If you, <coughs> if you consider the teaching of St. John of the Cross, what he says is that our senses, speaks about his class, but anyway, we understand what he wants to say today. The five senses should be under the guidance, I would say, of our intellect, our will and memory, and our intellect. And where? Memory. And the guidance or faith. And our hope and love. So this is the whole spiritual life. If you see someone in me and you feel nothing, what you know means nothing. This is how we develop it. If someone mentioned this problem of teenager violence in schools, the reason the main reason, I believe, is that our emotional intelligence did not develop. Our cognitive intelligence is increasing. But our emotional and social intelligence is declining. And this gap is the cause of what happens today. And the reason why we have this gap is because we are used to communicate today by Facebook and messages. We just click and message is sent. We don't see the face of the person who receives my message. We don't feel his emotions. We don't feel anything. We just have an information. And this is the consequence of uh, uh, the consequence of, of the development, scientific and technological. But this is fine. This is fine. This is something that is desirable. But we have to respond to the challenge of our time. And to know how to develop other, other elements, the spiritual intelligence also. How to develop that today. This is our task today. This is what we are in charge to do. And uh, help people to grow integrally completely, not only in their conscience, consciousness, <coughs> aware of what is happening, they are aware. But they should grow completely. And the intellectual development should be followed by emotional and social understanding. Social understanding is also is the environment of the issue, to understand what happens and answer properly. So this, this is the challenge. And in our spirituality centers, in our Carmelite uh, person, we have answers to that. We know that we should improve, develop spiritually, complete senses, intellect, and also our faith, theology. We should know what theologically 
what, what is the answer. But completely, the whole person is included. And I believe really in our karma and charism, we have answer to the, this issue. We know how to, we have in our tradition a um, proper response to the challenges we encounter today. The challenges that are basic of human, that basic insight. And if we don't answer, who will answer to, to this youth, young people, elderly people, doesn't matter. You know, I, I work in school now, elementary school. What happens? Uh, someone uh, kicks somebody else. Kills nothing after that. Children, they're not responsible for what they are. We made them such. This is our responsibility. They're a product of our society, or our relationships in our families. They spend more time outside their families than inside, because people work today, mother, father. When they are home, they don't communicate. I, a few months ago, I went to visit my sister. She has four children. They are teenagers. And uh, she had she, for two of them, they are uh, sisters, two sisters and uh, two brothers. So one of them was uh, in the dining room, and she was sending messages on her cell phone. After a while, I asked her, where is your sister? And she said, well, wh whom are you sending these messages? And she said to my sister. I said, where is she? She said, in the next room. <laughs> I'm not joking. So they, they used to communicate in such a way. And it is so strange that, that their emotional, social intelligence is not developed. It's just a concept. They don't know that another world is, it exists. This is their world, which we create. I'm sorry for speaking so long. <laughs> Uh, this question is uh, for Father Fernando and any other uh, Carmelite in the, in the room who, who might want to respond to it. I've been a Lake Carmelite for about 10 or 11 years now, and I'm currently the formation director of my community. Um, in the many encounters I've had over the years at various Carmelite functions, we've, I've noticed that the Lake Carmelites are generally over the age of 60. And we are finding that in trying to recruit new members or trying to get uh, the Car Carmelite spirituality to appeal to people, it's very difficult to appeal to people under the age of 50 because of the busy nature of their lives. You just mentioned your sister with four children. Uh, it seems like um, some people don't want to, or many people don't consider a Carmelite vocation until they've retired and they have time for the contemplation, the meditation, and so forth. So my, my question is, is, is uh, how can you help us with this challenge? Um, what can you do to help us to develop a message that we can use to appeal to men and women, um, middle-aged and under, who would find Carmel a foundation, a strength, a rock uh, in their life, lives, in their busy, busy lives. Um, maybe it's media, uh, maybe it's, uh, you know, someone said webinars are part of it, but, but we don't have, it doesn't seem to me that we have a concerted uh, recruiting process or appeal process, an integrated one throughout all the provinces and the chapters and the communities. We all sort of try to do our own thing. Maybe if we leverage collectively, we can get further. Thank you. So she said at the beginning, this is a question for Father Fernando or whoever. <laughs> <laughs> Just in 
Okay. Yes. Have you want to say something? Yeah. Good. That is always a good song. <laughs> Ready to help. Thank you. Um, my charism, my work, is facilitating the St. Ignatius spiritual exercises. And so I draw the Jesuits um, to draw people into prayer. Uh, most of the people who come and want the hunger to go deeper in prayer are in their 30s, 40s, and 50s. And so I try to adjust the schedule when we meet to meet their work needs, sometimes Saturday morning, sometimes in the evening. But once they commit to go through the exercises and they start praying uh, for the shorter retreat, 20 minutes to 30 minutes a day, or for the longer retreat, an hour a day, they're they understand what going deeper in prayer is, and they're hungry for it. And then you can introduce them to the carnal life community um, because they, they want more. Another action? Being from the younger generation, uh, those 60 or below. Uh, I think a lot of what's been discussed today, uh, Dr. Tucker's call for the uh, cultural revolution. Uh, that's, the, that's the Pope. <laughs> Ecological. And I think they're related. And it, it seems as though Father Fernando's um, talk on uh, going to the peripheries with our Carmelite charism, identifying with the peripheries are and viewing the world from that periphery uh, has an answer to this. It's, like you said, it, there's a lot of busyness. I come from that uh, finance background. I was a commodities trader for almost 10 years. Um, did some financial advising. And I've, I've lived and I've seen that busyness. Um, and it wasn't until I had a reorientation, not in my values, but in my, um, what's the word, my priorities. Um, so it's, I think it's a messaging. Uh, system that we need to work through, that our charism can speak to. And like you were saying, collectively coming together, identifying how we want to help people re reprioritize that going 24 hours, seven days a week isn't a healthy thing. Uh, bringing that silence, that stillness to the world um, is be a valuable, as, yeah, valuable thing we can tap into. And going little by little and just being present in the world, uh, putting that out there in different ways, using our own creativity, um, having these conversations that we're having today. I think these are all steps in the right direction. Uh, so hopefully we can bring these into our schools, different, different ways that the youth are communicating and pulling them away from the Facebook text messages from room to room. Um, into actually an actual human interaction, uh, bringing the balance back to our lives and to one another and reconnecting. Mike. Any other answer? Mike. I have one. My goodness. <laughs> <laughs> more practical vision. I just want to make a short comment. It's good that try to attract, uh, attract young people. But I think I'd like to quote from Father Al Sariki, who used to be our potential director. Uh, he said that he said most Carmelites come in the middle age because you know they've, they've been around the block a few times. They've established themselves, they've established a family, and they're wondering what else is there to life. And so you know, Carmelite charism goes deeper, and you have to have an initial experience to go below that. But maybe people down in the 30s and 40s are going to go into the crisis. <laughs> people in crisis to have provocations. <laughs> um, for me, it all started with a little book called Incandescence, and it's a collection of short meditations from the women mystics of the church, and it's by Carmen somebody, I've forgotten the last name, I still have it. It's very meaningful for me because it was the first time I really learned what well excuse me is all about. I thought 
these women love. And that's what real love is. So it was five minutes out of my day in the car sometimes. I also used a little book called Earth Prayers. But it was five minutes listening to these great women and what they had to say about their love for Jesus and how they opened out their heart and poured that love out on the door. And uh, it made a big difference in my life. Five minutes, five minutes, and start a new world. And yet at the same time, 
we hear in the gospel that we are to take the narrow way. Even though God's mercy is so wide and gracious, we are to take the narrow way. And that is because we can very easily, as we see the struggle between Abraham and Lot, fix our attention on possessing those many blessings to the point that we forget that all of that is to stir in our soul an appreciation of our relationship with God. That God doesn't want to give just things but himself, which Jesus came to announce to us, to bring about. I know in these days that you're also considering how the writings and the teachings of Pope Francis coincide with the wonderful Carmelite tradition and where you see those links. And as I read the joy of the gospel, the joy of love, and his other writings, no doubt you'll see, it occurs to me that he's very much in tune, maybe not intentionally, but surely it really is evident if you look at his writings that he breathes the air of the Carmelite tradition. And especially I see that as I think about that short way, that short method that John of the Cross talks about in the Ascent, Book 1, Chapter 13, those four counsels that he gives, I think they're so very evident in the writings of the Holy Father. The first counsel he tells us, and you know better than I, is to get to know Jesus, to model our lives after being Jesus, to see how he actually acts. And that is so very important for the Holy Father, where he begins to unfold the Gospels in such a way that he invites us to journey with the Lord, to walk with the Lord, to let the Lord accompany us in our life as he did with those people that are recounted in the Gospel. It is a spiritual life that begins not with penitential practices, not with disciplining ourselves, but a relationship that we build with Jesus Christ. That's the first step to the narrow way. It is the narrowness of two people standing together, seeing eye to eye, walking together. That's the narrowness and where it begins. And then he tells us to make sure that whatever we do, we always are in tune with the task of giving glory to God. What does it mean to give glory to God? Well, it means allowing the Lord to be known in the world. If there is not love there, put love in the sense. And so the narrowness of our love, spiritual lives should be not about our own glory, but giving glory to God, bringing the Lord into the world. I was talking to someone before in the sacristy about that little book that he and Matthew wrote called The Impact of God. And I always like that little phrase he used. He said, the spiritual life is not so much about making God an important factor in our lives, but seeing that we are an important factor in God's life. That's what it means to give glory to God. And something that the Holy Father time and again repeats in his writings that we have a purpose, we have a part in the plan of God. That is the respect that we should think about our lives. It's not about building a career or accumulating wealth and prestige, but always keeping in focus how what we're doing is giving glory to God by having God's plan unfold through what we do and say. And then he says, Make sure that the way that you choose is disciplined, not by how it brings you ease and comfort, but rather even choose those things that are difficult at times. Someone told me as I came in, your schedule must be very difficult. It was probably difficult for you to be here today. I said, well, John of the Cross said, choose the difficult. <laughs> And that is counterintuitive to us. That's where the sacrifice begins. It doesn't begin in terms
terms of the kind of spirituality that is just about self-abnegation, where we discipline ourselves through penitential <coughs> practices just to make ourselves feel good, and take delight in the fact that maybe we're able to sacrifice more than other people. No, it is an attitude that we develop that we're open to God giving us more in His time and His way, rather than filling in the gaps in our lives to ease our own suffering or making our lives more convenient on our own purposes in our own ways. Again, the Holy Father in the Sea, time and again, talks about the importance of not having an approach to the environment solely in terms of the crisis that we face here, in terms of the material world being compromised by the degradation of the ozone or the global warming that's taking place, but rather to begin with understanding that it impacts our spiritual life, that not only are we creating by our surplus and our extravagance, mm -hmm deserts in the world in terms of how the planet is drying up, but the spiritual desert that's taking place in our lives as well. And finally, I like that last council. Maybe a summary of it is, don't take yourself so seriously. Don't make a big thing about your spiritual development in life to the point that your whole life is about organizing around your ego that you accomplish something. But rather, have an attitude of freedom internally in which you know that God is doing much more than you are. God meets you more than halfway. And the Holy Father again, time and again, tells especially those who are in leadership positions in the church, don't make a big deal about your title, about your position, about your clerical state. <clears throat> that is a way that is not according to Jesus' narrow way. That's a way of positioning yourself so that others might give you praise or honor. Don't make a big deal about your spiritual life to the point that it becomes the sole focus of your accomplishment. So as we think about the readings today of how the Lord gives us the promise of such richness, and yet to accept it by the narrow way, I think Pope Francis, Pope Francis and John of the Cross and Teresa of Avalon all have harm like tradition speak together in one voice and remind us today of those counsels that I know that you try to live by. I think it's important for you as you go back to your communities and maybe work especially with young people to help them attune their lives in that way. Young people today are very are searching, many times lost, because they have so many options in their life. If you can just begin by engaging them, by inviting them to get to know Christ, to live their lives in a way that gives glory to God, but practicing saying no, but also realizing that the Lord is doing much more in their lives than they will ever come. That is an important message that the world, especially our young people, need today. And I encourage you, as you take up this work and continue your discussions in these days, to pray especially for young people and to realize that you have so much to offer. It is the promise of God's many blessings, as many as the stars in the sky, and yet invited to see that they receive it.